for one. Um, let me know if the microphone is not strong enough. I can probably turn it on. Uh, um, so my name is Stephanie Martin. I'm a postdoc fellow at the Ali Gilou Data Science Institute. I work also in Brad's lab, um, and I'm happy to be here today to talk about speech decoding from brain signals. Uh, that's a topic that I've uh, extensively studied during my PhD thesis that I did uh, in Switzerland. And so if you have any questions or anything that is not clear, feel free to ask questions. And I've left also my email address in case you want to discuss further in the future. Um, okay, speech decoding from brain signals. Why do we care? Um, the reason is that there are several, like many neurological disorders that lead to severe paralysis. Um, so I've listed here a few examples. You can have a traumatic brain injury or a stroke. Stroke affects millions of people around the world. Or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, that is a disease that leads to a progressive loss of all uh, motor neurons that connect your brain to your muscles. And so all those disorders leads to severe paralysis and you cannot talk or communicate, although you are fully aware of what you want to say. So you're basically really prisoner of your own body. And then in, um, I don't know if you know this book, uh, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Um, it was a book written by Jean-Dominique Jean Bobby, who was a fam famous editor, um, I, don't, I don't remember which magazine, but from one day to another, he got a stroke and became completely locked in. So locked in is this syndrome when you really cannot move anything but maybe a, an eyelid or, and so with the help of the caregivers, they would like say out loud letters sequentially and he would blink every time he would select a letter. And so letter by letter, he wrote this book that really describes how horrible this condition is and that his mind and mind wandering is the only thing that allows him to escape a bit. Um, okay, so in those cases, it would be really useful to have a speech uh, decoding system that records the brain signals and translate the brain signals in a more natural and intuitive way. Another approach, so here is, is more like the first uh, motivation was to help people with disabilities. Another really trendy field right now is human augmentation. So it's more like people that are completely able that want to augment their capacity, their physical capacity or their intellectual capacity. And so there are a lot of, um, of interest from neurotech companies. For instance, Facebook has 60 people working on a mind reading device. So they're developing a new technology, non-invasive technology that allows to decode words and they're targeting to be able to decode 100 words per minute. So that's faster than we actually speak. Other companies like Microsoft has bought also brain computer interface patents. They want to connect our brain with uh, computers. Or Elon Musk has invested the last year millions of dollars to develop a new brain implant that can really connect your brain and your device. Finally, I've mentioned Google. Google is also working on a mind reading device. Um, so yeah, there is really a lot of um, interest from neurotech and I think here also we should be a bit careful. As neuroscientists, we kind of know what is possible and popular media often talk about mind reading device or have catchy titles like that. And so it's a little bit difficult to disentangle what is true or not. And so here in this presentation, I'll kind of show a bit the state of the art. So how do we do that? How can we connect our brain to machines and add a digital link uh, than our regular normal um, motor system? So for this, we need brain machine interface. Uh, how does that work? We record um, the brain activity using either an invasive or non-invasive uh, technology. We acquire the signal. We extract some features because looking at the signal like that is very noisy and the patterns are not very explicit. So we extract the patterns. 
then we do some machine learning and have a decoding model that can either do classification or regression, and this results in an action. For instance, moving a robotic arm. And then with the feedback, you close the loop and the person either learns to modulate its brain activity to control the device. So I'll give a few examples of how this is used um, for assisting people. Uh, for instance, the BrainGate project is a big consortium between Brown, Stanford, and a few other universities. And they, in this study, this person was tetraplegic, and for the first time, using a brain implant, could move the robotic arm and drink by herself. So how she's doing this, it's kind of, so this is the small implant. It's a four by four millimeter implant that is implanted and can record neuronal activity. So but by decoding this brain activity, we can really operate uh, um, robotic arms. Or another study that came last year, maybe you've seen it, it's uh, done by a group at EPFL uh, in Switzerland that they showed that three people with spinal cord injury that were in wheelchair, they couldn't walk anymore, they were completely paralyzed of their lower limbs, could walk again. And they did this using a neurotechnology based on epidural electrical stimulation of the spine. And um, yeah, so this is not really directly a brain machine interface, uh, but there are a few elements that are interesting from a data science point of view. So I thought it would be interesting for you guys to to see it. And then also they're working on a, on a brain decoder, so they will integrate this soon in their uh, system. So how does this system work? So first, they have really um, multi-directional gravity assist robots that they developed that can really adapt the weight and direction in three dimensions to assist and personalize uh, the, the, the the body weight support for the patient. They also have um, wireless EMG sensors on the legs that allows to measure the muscle activity. And then here the important part is that it's wireless. You want to study walking, you cannot have cables that come out uh, all over in the lab if the person is wandering around. And then you have other reaction force sensors on the foot that measure pressure and that indicates the different cycles of like the walking. And then finally, they also have 14 cameras in the lab uh, that allows to track body kinematics. So for instance, uh, joints. What is the joint angle? What is the joint position, limb position? And with this system, they really have to process all kinds of different signals. They have to do v image processing to extract the kinematic information. They have to do signal processing to extract the EMG information and so on. And so they study extensively uh, those signals in healthy participants. And then they can move on to people with disabilities. So they implant uh, a pulse generator. Um, and then they also have this electrode array that is in, like, uh, um, put in the spinal cord. And then they can really reproduce and simulate here the patterns that are observed in healthy participants. So this is really like a big work with different components. And here I'm just gonna show a video of how like this looks like, those signals. You have the different cyclic activation of the EMG signals. You have the different phase of walking using, by analyzing the kinematic activity. Okay, and so here anyway, it's just to show that this is what they've done last year. By simulating the different spinal cord nodes, they can really walk again. And then they stop the simulation and boom, the person cannot walk anymore. They turn on again the simulation and the person can walk. So this is an example of what we can do with data science, with signal processing, and the kind of application that we are up to today. 
Now, wh where are we for communication? What is the state of the art for brain-machine interface for communication? So most of the applications today use a P300 speller, for instance. This is a non-invasive recording. You use a EEG cap. And then you look at this flickering screen. For instance, if I want to type a P, I look at P, and every time it's flashing, I have a brain response, and I can decode this brain response, and then decode that you're looking at the P, and so on. This is not very natural and intuitive to look at this flickering screen. So an alternative is the BrainGate project that I've mentioned already before. They work on this invasive implant. Oh, sorry. Well, video is not there. And this is really the state of the art for communication. They can select letters one by one on the screen. And they type a few letters per minute, and then they can type sentences or, or words but it's not very natural again. They need to imagine moving your, your left arm to control the, the, the decoder. I'm not sure actually the sound is on. Let me see. So I think it's only for, um, yeah. It's just for after because I have a few videos. Uh, you should ID. Uh, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> okay, so anyway, all those applications that we all have now for communication and helping those people, they are not very natural. They are not very intuitive. I need to look at a flickering screen to select letters. That's very exhausting and not very natural. Here again, in this application, the, the person has an implant in the motor cortex. They need to imagine moving her left arm or her right arm to move the cursor left or right. So all those applications are not natural. So there is really a need to find alternatives, uh, more like a mind-reading type of device that is based on speech synthesis. So it's really more like decoding in real time brain activity and synthesizing the speech uh, from there. So to do that, where do we start? We need a recording technique that allows us to, to monitor brain activity with high spatial and temporal resolution. And so EEG is not really good for that because it has really low uh, spatial resolution. Uh, MRI has a really good temporal resolution, uh, a really good spatial resolution, but not a really good uh, uh, temporal resolution. So it's also not a really good candidate to study brain and decode brain signals. So an alternative here is to use electrocorticography. This recording technique, I don't know if you're familiar with it and if you've seen it in other classes, but basically you implant electrodes, you remove a big part of the skull, you, inc you, uh, you uh, then overlay with an electrode grid, and then you can record really the brain activity with high spatial and temporal resolution. Now the downside with this technique is that it's only in rare cases that uh, we can have access to this type of data. It's only in epileptic patients. When patients have seizures and they're resistant to medication, um, they need to have a part of their brain removed. And in order to localize which brain area is uh, not functioning well and which part of the brain needs to be removed, they are implanted with those grids like that for 10 days, two weeks. And during this time, they are at hospitals. We take advantage of this opportunity to do some experiments with them and acquire data. So this is a really good candidate for studying speech. And for those of you who are sensitive to uh, blood, I highly encourage you to close your eyes. Um, so you see the procedure is really massive, is not very convenient for the patient, right? He has a big chunk of the skull removed and then the electrodes implanted. So then, 
and then, yeah, you also have those cables coming out. So for the patient, it's really not very pleasant. But then he's also at hospital during two weeks, just lying in, in bed and waiting for seizures. So that's really when we go in with our laptops and we do some experiment with them. Okay, once we have the, um, the uh, signal acquired, how can we target speech synthesis or speech decoding? There are mainly two different approaches, either based on regression or on classification. So here the idea is that you can either classify um, brain signals into discrete speech units. For instance, phonemes, that is the smallest uh, speech unit. Uh, for instance, phonemes are all the vowels and consonants. Or you can decode directly words. Words are more like carrying a semantic meaning. For instance, for someone that is paralyzed that cannot communicate, if you can already say a few clinically relevant words, for instance, um, hungry, thirsty, pain, love, that would be already more natural than having to move your left or right limb to control the cursor on the screen. So yes, the whole question is which speech unit is better, which speech unit uh, carries more information. And then the second approach is instead of um, decoding discrete units, you decode continuous speech parameters, for instance, form and frequency, or the speech envelope, or the spectrogram features. And here it's really trying to predict as close as possible uh, those parameters, and then from those parameters you can recreate a sound. And I'll show you a few examples uh, soon. And yes, uh, no matter what, here whether you decode discrete units or continuous parameter, then the idea is really to, yeah, synthesize uh, speech. Now in both cases, whether you use classification or regression, you need to have a framework. So this framework is you need the data. For instance, here it's the ECOG uh, signal. You also need some speech representation. So this is supervised learning. You need to know and label the data for now. So here, for instance, you give some audio input to the person, the person listens to speech, and you measure both in synchrony. And then you need to extract some features. Here, for instance, you can extract different frequency bands. Like, uh, I don't know if you've seen this in class, but uh, the brain activity, you can filter it in several frequency bands, and each frequency can carry different information. So this is a way of extracting the features. And then also here, for instance, the audio signals, instead of having just the audio waveform that fluctuates, you also need to extract the pattern. Here, for instance, the spectrogram. And then you split your data set into training and testing sets. You want to build your model only on the tra training set, and you want that this model generalizes to new unseen data. So it predicts new data that you haven't seen. And this is kind of the basis of brain-machine interface, right? To have a model that you can apply in the future and continuously predicting new uh, dimension. So here now I'm going to show a study that was done by a former colleague of mine, Brian Paisley, uh, who basically showed that you can give speech input to a person, so a patient is listening to speech, you measure the brain activity and the audio, and then you can really use regression to find those sets of weights that can then translate this brain activity to a spectrogram representation of the sound. So it's really like finding a mapping between brain activity, that is the input to your regression, and a spectrogram that is the output of your regression. And using this approach, he showed that you can really recreate the sound. So, uh, so here you have a few examples of original spectrogram for, um, for several world, words. And then here you have the reconstruction that you get with the, with the, the decoding model. 
So you see it's a bit noisy, but it's far from random and it's still fairly accurate. And so if this would work. So this is how it sounds. Waldo. Waldo. Structure. Doubt. It is it. Property. Okay, did you hear? I'm gonna play it again. Structure. Doubt. So it's not perfect, but it's definitely Property. far from random, right? So the first time I heard that, I was pretty impressed. Like this is the sound you get from brain signals. You all you get is this noisy fluctuating signals, and then you can find a model that can reconstruct the sound. I was pretty amazed in 2008. And now there is a kind of trick here, is that the fact that I showed you first the original sound and then the reconstruction, I kind of cheated because I primed you to understand really the audio. Here, Back then we didn't know that, but the fact of showing first an audio that is high quality and then an audio that is um, noisy, your brain actually reconstructs and kind of fill in the gap. So here, that's what I'm showing here. You, oops. People don't just passively listen to signals and, and to sensory stimuli but they make active inference about what the signal is supposed to be. And this really helps you when the speech is noisy to kind of fill in the gap based on your experience. And so here, this is another study from a colleague of mine that exactly showed this, and I'm not sure if this is gonna work. Um, so here, I'm gonna show you the sound that is filtered and not really good quality. You're not gonna understand what this sounds like. Then I'm going to show you the unfiltered sound. And then again, the very same stimulus that I showed the first time. And then you'll see the second time. Because you know already what the sentence is, you'll understand it better. Let's see if this works. Okay. Did you? Did you understand anything? Yeah. So I'm not sure. Let's try. Maybe I can increase the volume here. It's not very loud, right? Yeah, no. So maybe it's probably just me too, the preferences. Did you hear, do you understand anything? Oh, okay. If this doesn't work, it'll be really embarrassing. If this doesn't work, it'll be really embarrassing. So you hear it the second time, now you cannot undo it. If this doesn't work, it'll be really embarrassing. If, the, if this doesn't work, it will be really embarrassing. So the fact of showing, but you understood already kind of the first time, you have like a, so here now, maybe I can play it again, uh, those ones. Waldo? So 
you see also that I show you first the quality sound and then the second sound kind of primes you to understand uh, uh, the, the audio. And so here I forgot to mention that even the first sound is not very good quality, you probably noticed, is because here what we reconstruct is only the spectrogram, so it's the amplitude in each frequency band, but we lose the phase information. And then an audio waveform is phase and amplitude. So here, from the spectrogram to go back to the audio waveform, we already kind of lose some accuracy. And so that's why like, I showed only the best we could reach and then the reconstruction. So anyway, you got it. So the brain really is smart in a sense is that it doesn't just passively sit here that we receive information. It really makes active inference and tries to fill in the gap. And this really allows you when there is a noisy environment based on your knowledge, based on the speech structures to reconstruct what you hear. So here, yeah, it was kind of cheating. But then this doesn't matter anymore because now we kind of move towards deep neural networks. Linear models are outdated. Um, now, uh, ne even neuroscience has been uh, invaded by a deep neural network. And, and probably you've had other classes on neural networks. Neural networks have been here for decades. And it's just that now we have more power, more data, and so we can build models that have more layers and that are more complex. But is in the end still the same. So here I'm gonna show you a study in which, um, again, the person was listening to speech and they recorded the, brains, the brain uh, activity and, and the speech signal in synchrony. And then they built this neural network that is based on two different uh, modules. The first one here, oh, maybe, that's, maybe I'll take my laser. So here, the first component is to extract features. This is basically a filter. It tells you which electrodes, for instance, contains information or what time point uh, contains information. Because when you listen to speech, the brain activity is not instantaneous, but there are some delays, for instance, 300 milliseconds to process a word or something like that. And so the first part use deep neural network to extract those features. And here, this was kind of the first study that used deep neural networks, so it was more exploratory. There was not an a priori knowledge on how to build uh, the, the neural network. So here they compared like different uh, networks that are either fully connected or only locally connected and they see like which performed better. But here it was more of an engineer approach where you really try to extract the signal and predict uh, the speech parameters at, as best as you can. And the second part of the, 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 the decoding was more um, to reconstruct the speech parameters. In this case, it was more uh, the speech envelope, the form and frequencies, that is basically your, your pitch uh, in the audio waveform. And so using this also, I think they did a pretty good job this is the audio signal that you get with uh, this neural network approach. Do you understand what they... But so it's pretty crazy that this is the input that you give to your model. It's something that really is not interpretable and then you pass it, you do some transformation and you can get an audio signal. It's like really a translator. Uh, it could be from the decoding perspective, it could be also that you understand that those are digits. And again, your brain, as soon as you understand that those are digits, it's like logical to have one, two, three, four, five. 
So again, here, your, your brain probably gets better at understanding. So I can play it again. Otherwise, I don't know if, if, if really the quality is better. Could be depending also on the sounds and. Do you have a question? Here it was zero. Yeah. It is in order. Yeah. No, so it starts at zero, one, two. But still, here it's not perfect, but I, I still think it's pretty impressive, kind of how it sounds. It's a bit synthetic, but I think we're getting there. But anyway, this was during speech perception. What do you do then with an application that can reconstruct the sound you heard? So there is another study that targeted speech production. Here it's kind of already more um, towards a mind reading device. You can decode speech production. They could also decode just the articulators without producing any sound. And so you see we're going closer towards a mind reading device in that sense. So here what they did, they kind of used a different neural network architecture. So here they had uh, long short term memory uh, neural network um, that again took as input the brain activity. And then the first part of the first part of the neural network was about decoding kinematics of the articulators. So in the previous study I've also showed when they were restoring walking in people with a spinal cord injury, that they were measuring all the kinematics. Here you can do the same with the articulators. You can measure the lip position, you can move, measure the throat position. And so here the first part was really to reconstruct and predict what is the configuration of your throat. And then it takes into account memory because you want to have a smooth sequence. You don't, if you are in one position at one point, you cannot jump and go to another completely different position is because you're limited by, you're constrained by muscles and the, the articulators. So here the first part was about decoding the articulators. And then the second part is once you know the position of the articulators, the throat, the tongue, uh, the lips, you know how it's supposed to sound like. So from the decoded articulators, then you can infer and predict the sound. And so here is another example. So this is the brain activity. Okay, I'm gonna pause. So here you see the articulators that were decoded. This is what they predict with the first part of uh, the decoder. And then here is the spectrogram. This is what they get with the second part of the decoder. And so here also they play the noisy one first this time, the actual one, and then again the noisy one. Also the fact that here, all the sentences that are used to build those models, they're kind of weird and difficult to, those are not sentences that we use on a daily basis. And so that's why also it's hard to understand them is because you would never predict that this is the actual sentence.
Okay, and so here this time they really did some extensive uh, testing if it's if this speech is intelligible and if people could identify uh, the, the sound. And so this it was highly significant. They did some massive uh, behavioral testing. Um, and so, yeah, the, the next step in this study is that they were able to reconstruct the sound even if the person was not producing any sound. So it's, the person was just miming the, the articulators, but then, here is uh, how it sounds. Okay. So this is the state of the art for speech synthesis from brain signals. So it's good, but still, how do we decode inner speech? How do we go one step further and do mind reading? Because here, all the studies I've shown, it was either speech perception or speech production. And in those cases, you have really a massive brain response. So it's kind of easier to, to decode those brain signals. But for inner speech, it's a whole other story. So here, just before entering into detail, mind and thoughts what popular media call mind and thoughts are very abstract concepts. It includes everything. I can be remembering what I was doing, what I was eating for breakfast, or planning what I will do during the weekend, or I can solve a problem in my head. All this is mind wandering, and you go from one brain region to another. So it's very abstract and a difficult task to do to extract the brain information. And so here, I'm going to show you a few studies that I worked on during my PhD thesis that really aimed at decoding the verbal representation of speech. So it's not, yeah, it's really this verbal, it's this inner voice that you have in your head. And so inner speech decoding is very challenging. As I said before, like when you do speech perception or speech production, you can label the data very accurately. You know exactly what happened when because you have both the speech and the brain activity. During inner speech is more complicated. It's because you don't have any behavior. You cannot record, I'm thinking a sentence right now. What did I think? When did I start? When did I stop? We don't have a good way of measuring uh, the, the behavior. And in addition, also speech is unique to, to humans. We only, um, yeah, for all, all other brain function like memory, navigation, we can study it in animal. But for speech, we're the only species on earth to use such a complex uh, language system. And yeah, speech is also very complex. This is just a map to indicate how complex and it's very hierarchical. I'm not a linguistic person. I don't know if there's any linguistic person, but there are so many different hierarchical uh, processing steps during speech that makes us understand what the person says. We need to extract phonemes, string them together, extract words, meaning, grammatics. We need to remember what the person said. We need to plan our response. So it's very complicated and we're still not quite sure how it fully works in the brain. And so yeah, so those are just a few challenges that I wanted to highlight. Um, and the last one also that I didn't mention is that I can produce 10 times the, uh, the same word or sentence, hungry, hungry, hungry. And it's never gonna be exactly the same uh, replication because 
you have stretching and compression or onset delays. It's never, we're not robust. So when we speak, we really have a lot of variability and fluctuation. So during inner speech, it's even more complicated if you have those jitters. Like even if you, you record, for instance, two trials in one electrode, two trials of the word hungry, you have the brain response. Then the person imagine hungry again, you have the second brain response. And because of those onset delays, the patterns are not aligned in time. And so a classifier, if you're trying to classify the, those two words, they would not be classified as belonging to the same class just because those patterns are not aligned. So there are a lot of challenges. Do you have a question? So your question was, if you're having emotions or different emotions, how would this be reflected in kind of the brain activity? That's a very good point. And that's also something, so the work on, on inner speech was very scarce. There's not a lot of work done. And so we haven't investigated this for now. But for sure, emotion from one day to another, also your emotion change, it will change your brain activity. The same as I showed before with your experience that can change uh, your brain response to twice exactly the same stimulus. Emotion can affect. Now here, I'm gonna show two studies where probably it doesn't matter because we recorded just 20 minutes of recording with the patient and not across days. So we can assume that emotions were more or less the same during those 20 minutes. And then anyway, like our decoders just tried to extract the discriminant information and kind of filtered out what was not consistent across trials. So if for instance, in that case, your emotion would change maybe the brain activity at a specific location, it would be kind of filtered out because it's not consistent. So for now, we're just really trying to see what is consistent within a class and what is, in, and what is different across classes. And this is the electrodes, for instance, that we would extract or the brain patterns that are relevant. But then I agree with you that it's a whole other story. Once you want to really go to natural speech synthesis across days, you need to start taking this into account, like emotions and how maybe this will be reflected in also in your production. If you're emotional, your voice will change. If you're angry or happy, and those are sub, uh, segmental features that need to be taken into account in the future. Yeah. Exactly. So then also if you would decode phonemes, for instance, you need to adapt the phoneme based on if it's at the beginning of the word or if it's at the end or of a sentence. So you need to change the intonation or the stress. With decoding parameters, you would probably be able to directly track those kind of intonation. That's what they do in the field of speech recognition. They've done this for 80 years. They're pretty good at uh, modulating the intonation based on if it's a question or an end of sentence or putting the stress on the word depending on uh, the location of the, but, but uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, decoding movement and reaching and controlling a robot is universal. Like, it's, it's the same for everyone to some extent. Speech already, just the fact that we have different language, they use different structures, is very complicated. And so step by step, we're moving, yeah, really slowly. Is there any other questions?
that's a, also a very interesting point. And so that's why here we kind of restricted the instruction, we constrained the instruction that we gave to the participants is really like, I'll show the studies later, but you are completely right. Like, the mind, and that's why we need to be careful, and that's why when all the entrepreneurs and the neurotech are talking about mind reading device, we're all be connected, we'll be able to decode, is that mind is so abstract, right? My mind is different from yours, and as you said, we just have fragments, it's not linear, it's segmented, or you, I may be more a visual person, so I'm more in my mind visual, like uh, imagine, yeah, images, you may be more abstract. Some other person could be more auditory and more like it, it's auditory images that are important. So this, those are all challenges that we're facing and we're not quite sure how it works, what's the best strategy. And so that's why for now the only way that we can progressing is by constraining the participants, teach him how to perform it. Even if you're a visual person here, you need to imagine hearing the word that you just heard. So then we, we know a bit that in that case, it would be activating more the auditory cortex. If you, we would say, imagine visualizing a word written, then the person would have more the visual cortex active. And so for now, we're at the stage that we're just constraining as much as possible but then, yeah, and from one day to another, it can change in the future. So having a mind reading device, there's still a long way to, to go. So you mean you, kind of a musical brain, like you would, you, you, I'm not sure if I get your question, if you would just like record the brain activity. Ah, oh, oh yeah. So there is not, so I'm, I'm not sure the, the brain makes sound as compared compared to the heart or the, but there is an interesting thing that people usually do. Let me see if I have the video again. Um, in the video that I showed here, they record neuronal activity. And so the neurons are spiky. And so here the trick is that every time you detect a spike, you play a noise like a pop. And so here I think you can hear <laughs> no, <laughs> I thought, the, the, so I don't think I have a video. I thought this one also recorded the brain activity. So you can basically hear, like if neuron fires, it would do like pop, 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 pop. And then if the neurons are silent, then th there would not be any noise. So that's not really the noise it actually do, it's just a representation of how we can perceive if a neuron fires or not. Um, but other than that, yeah, I don't I don't think uh, the brain makes any noise. Then you could more like doing some art project where you fit in the brain activity and based on the fluctuation, you decide to synthesize um, some some noise and, and eventually you would hear some, some patterns. Um, so let me go back. So yeah, I've worked on this during my PhD thesis and all those challenges are frustrating because yeah, it, it's, it's really hard to understand what's going on. It's hard to extract the patterns. It's noisy. So I'm gonna show you two studies um, that uh, one used regression. So it was more trying to synthesize those parameters and one was more classification. So it's again, this is regression versus classification approach. And so in the first approach, it's 
basically an extended work that I've shown before, where you have the brain activity, and we want to build a regression model with the audio input. Except that when you imagine, or you, when you have this inner speech condition, you don't have any audio, right? So how do you build your regression model? Because you only have the input to the, to the model, but not the output, so it's hard to do a regression in this case. So what we did is based on the fact that when you speak out loud, or when you speak in your head, you have some overlapping neural mechanisms uh, that occur. So it's not completely the same, but because there are some overlapping mechanisms, we thought that we could build a regression model when the person is speaking out loud, in which case we have both the input brain activity and the output audio signal. And so you find this model, and then we could apply this model to the inner speech condition or imagined speech condition. And so with this approach, we were able to reconstruct how the sounds of your head, your inner voice kind of sound like or look like. And then here we can compare with the original sound when they speak out loud. So this was the approach. And so this is just uh, the text that was displayed on the screen that the person had to speak out loud. This is the original spectrogram of when the person speaks out loud. And this is the inner speech reconstruction. So it's noisy, but you can identify some patterns that are similar. And so it was not good enough to reconstruct the sound, but we could hear some energy and but yes, that was kind of the approach of how we kind of hijacked a model from another condition and applied it to some kind of transfer learning approach. Yeah. Here? Yeah. So it's basically noise. Oh. Um, so just because here, um, this is just some noise level. When you reconstruct, actually, because you need to pre-process the data, and what we did in this case, we z-scored the brain activity to, to, to kind of regularize uh, the decoding model, and because we did those processing steps, it kind of changes the scale, and this gives additional noise. Uh, but we could probably have thresholded it, and. Okay, so that was the first approach. The second approach was more like classifying words. Um, so here the person was listening to a word and then a visual cue appeared on the screen and then the person had to imagine hearing that word that was just played. And then there was a second cue that appeared and the person had to speak out loud the same word. So we had those three conditions so that we could also investigate how one condition compares to the other and how words are processed during perception versus over speech. And so we had those five patients and we used some classifier support vector machine. I don't know if you've seen it in class, maybe. <laughs> They've seen it, okay, good. So I'm not going to enter too much into details. Um, but so here, support vector machine basically takes a kernel function and transforms this kernel function. And the kernel function basically look the similarity or dissimilarity between a trial with all the other trials. And so here, the input was, for instance, the brain activity at one electrode. And you see here, that's the example that I showed before. If you want to uh, classify those words because the patterns are not aligned, the classifier and the kernel or the support vector machine would not recognize those two trials as belonging to the same class. So here, the trick was to realign those patterns before classifying them. So we introduced some realignment algorithm, and once the patterns are aligned, then you can really start classifying them and comparing them. Uh, this is uh, just an example of brain activity, how it uh, works. 
so you have here the listening condition, the inner speech condition, and the over speech condition for different electrodes. And here in red, you have the audio envelope. So you see that you have some audio during listening, nothing during inner speech, and then audio during the over. The brain activity has really different patterns of activity. You have some electrodes that are active in all conditions. You have another uh, electrode just nearby here that is only active during perception and production, but not during inner speech. So you see here already the study before that I showed you, it was a bit of a naive approach to use just the same decoding model that was built during the over speech and applying this model to the inner speech because inner speech and over speech is not exactly the same. So probably we were also injecting noise. So anyway, here we had six different words and we wanted to try to see if we could classify one word versus another that the person was thinking. And so this is the result of the classification accuracy. Um, it basically show the pairwise classification accuracy. So we had two words and we tried to classify one word versus another. Already two words is difficult to classify. So imagine going to a bigger pool of words, like on a daily basis, I think we use in English 3,000 words. So here, just classifying two words is already a complicated task. But so here you can see the classification results for the listening condition. So in white is 100%, you're perfect at predicting the words. And in black is 50%, so it's chance level. You're not better than a random classifier. And so here in the imagined speech or inner speech condition, we still reach until 90% of classification accuracy for some words. So this is already encouraging and probably depending on where the electrodes are, you can find a set of words that are personalized for the participants, what is meaningful for the participants and based on where the electrodes are, we can probably find uh, words that are classifiable. Um, yes, here is just the anatomic map of where those brain areas that carries information are located. So you see here, because the instructions were, imagine hearing that word that you just heard, it's more the temporal lobe, the auditory cortex that is active. Maybe if we would have asked the person to imagine seeing the word, it would have been more visual cortex active. So anyway, here I've shown you two studies uh, that use different approach to classify uh, or regress some parameters during inner speech. So that's about it. That's kind of the state of the art for speech synthesis. We're making progress for speech perception and speech production. We're not quite there yet for a mind reading device that allows us to just think and communicate with Siri. And there are reasons for that. Why are we not there yet? Why are we so far? Is that we're currently limited by technology. Um, we have 80 billion neurons, we have trillions of connections and, and synapses, we just currently don't have the recording technique that allows us to monitor the brain activity with high spatial and high temporal resolution. And so here I think it, we're really at an exciting uh, moment for neurotechnology is that the industry is interested in this topic. So with more money, maybe we can develop uh, the new technologies that will allow us to, to get a bit further. And then the second, in my opinion, missing element that really prevents us from doing a mind reading device is we basically don't really know. And that joins a bit like what you've said before that mind is abstract, it can be anything. So where do we start to really target natural thought so in terms of understanding here, there is a huge gap. And without this knowledge, we cannot really target the, the 
yeah, a mind reading device. So I think I'm done for this topic. I don't know if there are other questions, as then I probably Professor Wojciech will complete the class with other slides because I think I'm, so are there questions? So for me, and the reason why I wanted to work is to help people with disabilities. Those are the people that are unlucky, that got an accident, or that are born like that. They are very isolated. If you cannot talk or communicate, what do you do? That's the most important uh, ability that we have, is to connect us with other people. and so. In terms of honorable, I think that's the way of using it. And that's also why we're targeting patients, is to help them. But it's also because those kind of electrodes that we implant, we cannot implant them in volunteers, right? And so the first step is to, to help patients. And I think once we reach this level, once we've made progress to help them, then we can start translating uh, those applications for human augmentation. But the fact that people, investors, entrepreneurs are really interested in this mind reading device, I think they're, they're not really interested in pe people with disabilities, right? They want a product that can be used by anyone. It's like all or nothing. And so, in that sense, I think maybe their interest is not very honorable in that sense. But they've also realized, for instance, that if you want to develop an implant that is invasive for targeting people uh, on a daily basis, it's not that easy. The procedure to have a new medical device on the market takes decades. And the first step to reach that is to first test it in patients that really need it, pa patients that are completely locked in. So I think that's what maybe those companies kind of did not understand is that it's not in five years we're all gonna be implanted and connected. It's because of the regulation, it's not feasible. But Yeah. I think it has a lot of potential. I think the road is still fairly long. And then another problem is still here I showed, for instance, the decoding accuracy was good but not perfect. What if your decoder, what if you're thinking something and your decoding system kind of misunderstood. And so here you may have misalignment. Wait, that's not what I'm thinking. That's not what I wanted to say. And so here you may have the general bias that you have for other artificial intelligence system where how do you have a system that generalizes for everyone? Because depending on opinions, on it may be different from one person to another. Yeah. So I'm always the pessimi a pessimistic person because I've worked on it. I'm like, oh, really? That's the best we can do? And then I read the news and I'm like decoding a hundred words uh, just by thinking and I'm like, oh, 
how, how are they going to do that? So I'm a pessimistic. I know other people that are fascinated by human augmentation and sci-fi books. And so, yeah, let's see what the, the future reserves us. But it's an exciting moment for neuroscience and neurotechnology. Um, it currently is not possible because of the skull. When you have an EEG cap, for instance, you can measure the fluctuation, but spatially, you don't discriminate really uh, the, the, yeah, the brain regions that are necessary, for instance. Um, I think there are some companies, Facebook, for instance, is developing a non-invasive technology. Because for now, if you want to target like the general public and on the, the general consumer, you need something non-invasive. And so right now, we're missing that part. We can de decode some patterns. For instance, if I move my, if I imagine moving my left arm, it creates a big blob of activity on the right. So you detect that. But then in terms of speak, speech, it's much more spatially located. And so this you cannot capture with the EEG cap. But we're making progress. High density EEG cap helps. Then they have some model of source localization and so it's getting better, but still for like a mind reading device, we're so far. Are there other questions? Sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Ah. Um, that's a good question. Um, so everyone was really excited to see that deep learning was also started to be used in neuroscience. The problem that we're facing in neuroscience with this kind of data is that we don't have much data available. So compared to big companies that have enormous amount of data to train their model and all those different layers and parameters, we only have, in those cases, for instance, 30 minutes of data for one patient. And then depending on where the electrodes are, you can build a model that is specific to the person, but this model will not generalize to other people, for instance, because the electrode location is not exactly the same or the brain shape is not exactly the same. So for deep learning and neural network is good, but for now, we don't have enough data and that's a bit the limitation. And slowly, and probably with uh, non-invasive recordings, you could record much more data. You just wear the cap the whole day and maybe this will help also. I don't think this has been done yet. Also at the hospital now, we start recording continuously the brain activity. So we monitor the patient. He's 24 seven at the hospital in an epilepsy monitoring unit. So there's video, there are microphones, yeah, so we can really start doing a lot and to model the more natural behavior, not in a constrained environment, but if he has family coming and talking, we can record the, the, the natural conversation. And so if we have more data, then that's where deep learning really becomes interesting and could be much more powerful uh, and this, so there is hope. Okay. 
That's a very good question or point. And so that's something we discuss also quite a lot with other people that are working on that is what is better? And so everyone agrees that there are limitations with the non-invasive and maybe by developing new technology, this is what's gonna save the non-invasive one. But the other interesting thing is that invasive technology may not be so invasive anymore. If you have a brain implant, for instance, there is one company that use uh, like uh, almost like stents that they use for heart to like open uh, um, capillaries. And they use this with electrodes on it. And so it can be inserted really with a catheter and then and then the, the electrodes lie here and you can record the brain activity. So is this really that invasive anymore? If you don't necessarily need surgery, you can go and, so I think there are those two trends are still gonna be explored either by improving the resolution of the non-invasive one or by making the invasive technology not invasive anymore. And if you can just go to your doctor, he gives you an implant injected and then it goes on to your brain and then you go out and you don't really need this whole skull removed and like the surgery part, then this becomes really interesting. So I think both are in the race. And Neuralink from Elon Musk is developing those implants that can be almost like, like a sewing machine. There's just poking in your, so if this is not a risky, would you do it? Which one would you choose? But this you could do with both invasive or non-invasive. Yeah. So how many people would accept to get an implant <laughs> if it requires a surgery to augment your, capa your abilities? So what would be your dream? To connect? Okay. Yeah. But then we could just also remove the brain, put it in a saline solution and have a simulated uh, world. How many people would get an implant if this allows you to connect to your phone and, and just like think you can still cook or do other daily activity and just like think something instead of speaking out loud to Siri? No? You're the only few? <laughs> okay, that's. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, so in that in that sense, yeah. Again, there are actually a lot of study that were trying to do that. There was another company that were trying to restore memory. So they were they wanted to simulate the brain and this would restore some memory. And still there are some preliminary studies that shows that you can reinstate a memory using brain stimulation, electrical stimulation, and to some extent write. But again, in, in both direction, I think reading and writing the brain is fairly complicated because of all the connections and your, yeah. But, but that's a, a good one. I think people are also really interested in writing the brain, again, to augment abilities. 
to augment attention. But if you stimulate a bit the brain and you, you're more focused. Is this the one you would choose? <laughs> no. <laughs> one module among others. Ah, <laughs> oh, okay, well, perfect. Thanks uh, for your attention and your questions.